<clears throat> in my earlier days when I was in cubicles, there were a lot of coworkers complaining about how my voice carried, so hopefully this will be okay. Um, first of all, I hope you all enjoyed the after hours session that we sponsored last night. Uh, just another. <laughs> It was just another version of our unlimited plans. <laughs> Hopefully, you aren't one of those outliers of usage <laughs> this morning. So maybe the lack of the microphones and such is uh, helpful to some of you that may have uh, enjoyed yourselves a little too much last night. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking a little bit about a very exciting program that uh, we announced in December of 20. 10 that we call Network Vision. And Network Vision for us is, a, is the most important network uh, modernization project we've had in a very, very long time. Uh, I've often likened it to really the equivalent of us launching the original PCS and Nextel networks back in the mid and late 90s. Um, so this program, it's multi-year. It's multi-billions, as you'd expect, but it also delivers not only billions of dollars of benefits to us over the next several years, but also puts us on not only a path to the future, but also creates a lot of opportunities, which I want to talk a little bit about at the end of, of the program. I also want to say, uh, before I get into the meat of the presentation, Sprint is real. aha. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I do want to say that Sprint is delighted to be one of the newest members of, of RCA. We really do look forward to working with the membership on all the issues that we have in the industry and find all those places we can collaborate and move the industry as a whole forward in the interests of not only our membership, but also for the general public. Okay, now. Okay, there we go. A um, little bit of a flyover of the technology. Um, it is, a, it is a platform that has been the culmination of a lot of development done by the, the infrastructure ecosystem of suppliers over the years. What we've really done is brought it all together in a package that we think is a bit of a unique deployment because we're using all this best technology to really put us in a place where we will not only upgrade our 3G network but really give us the flexibility for the future. So it includes some of the latest you know, ASIC designs, the latest software features, the latest radio technology, the, radio, the latest antenna technology, and puts it into an integrated package that we are looking forward to really delivering a huge amount of benefit to our customers. We often don't like to use the word feature-proof. However, <laughs> in the case of this network architecture, because it is so software-based, it really does position us to not only uh, you know, adapt all the technologies of today, but also put us in a position for what might become the 5G, 5G services of the future. On the, whoops, okay, back up there. All right, so on the bottom, I just wanted to give you a visual uh, of what the old versus new looks like. So the old is on the left. On the right-hand side is the, our, our typical outdoor CDMA cabinet. You see the, the cabling that goes up with the you know, one and a half or so inch uh, coax cables going to the top. On the left side, I also depict this happens to be a co-location site with our Clearwire partners where that's the WiMAX equipment. You take all that equipment, you look to the right, that's the new base station that is being provided by our three key suppliers. Our supply community, we've divided the country up in amongst three OEMs, uh, Samsung, Alcatel-Lucent, and Ericsson. So they're our partners in this program. Their equipment looks you know, roughly like you see on the right. I won't mention whose that is. Uh, but nonetheless, that single cabinet replaces all the cap capability that you see on the platform on the left. So you can see how much more capability, and as you'd expect, the stuff on the right is far more energy efficient and far more green than the equipment on the left. When we have the net, as we're deploying the network, what it does allow us to do is consolidate our network. So today we operate a CDMA network that covers about 38,000 cell sites across the country, an IDEN network on effectively a 2G technology, but it has a very important single feature that a lot of customers still uh, have as an integral part of their business, and that's the, the, what we call the button, uh, the push to talk, the chirp that, that many people have heard over time. 
And then the third network is actually the Clearwire network. So our partnership with Clearwire, and they provide our WiMAX 4G coverage today. The Network Vision platform has the capability of combining all that, and in conjunction with a new Sprint Direct Connect service that provides the same functionality as the IDEN button, we can put all that on a single network platform. So we'll take from about a 68,000 cell site combination of networks, not including the Clearwire network, we consolidate it down to about a 38,000 cell site providing all the same capabilities. It also gives us the ability to have a single handset that today, customers that depend on the button, for example, have to decide, I either want the button or I want broadband data services. Now we have devices that have both. In the future, we'll just continue with integrated devices that have all the capabilities of all the services that we provide on the network that we're building out. Now, a little bit of a word about our relationship with Clearwire because that certainly not only doesn't end, but it's actually evolved into a future that really gives us the opportunity to grow. So, as I mentioned, Clearwire provides the WiMAX capability. It covers about 70 plus markets, about 120 million pops for WiMAX 4G coverage. And as everyone knows, we were the first to launch a 4G service here in the States. We chose WiMAX because it was ready. We wanted to get out first, and it's been wildly successful for us. We launched the first 4G phone with the Evo back about a year and a half, going on two years ago, and it really, quite frankly, put Sprint back on the map with one of the leading iconic devices. And surprisingly, that original Evo is still one of our top selling devices. That's how good that device has been. We've obviously followed up with many, many other devices and involved that, uh, those service offerings beyond that. And we'll continue to sell WiMAX capabilities throughout this year. However, we won't be doing any more handsets that have WiMAX. We are actually making the move to LTE, and Clearwire is moving with us. In the fall of last year, Clearwire announced that they would begin uh, building out a 2.5 LTE network that will be an offload network that is a complement to, to our network platform. So what that puts us in a position is really having room to grow over the longer term through a combination of our network assets and the offload network that Clearwire is providing. So as we do the deployment, what we're doing today is we're uh, putting out the multimodal equipment that replaces all the stuff you saw in the earlier slide, gives us the upgrade in the 3G technology, adds LTE initially at the G block, so we'll have a two by five G block LTE nationwide footprint We'll be adding uh, pending FCC approval for the use. We'll be uh, adding LTE at 800. As we vacate and migrate customers from IDEN to CDMA, it vacates that spectrum. We have that spectrum available to us. That allows us to then repurpose approximately 14 megahertz of spectrum for a combination of voice and data coverage. Uh, and and that will come uh, more, the data portion of that comes in 2014. And then as the network continues to grow, we have then the offload capability with Clearwire and take advantage of the use of the 2.5 spectrum, which Clearwire has a lot of, but obviously it's not as you know, friendly from a propagation perspective as 800 and 1900, but it has the benefit of having a lot of bandwidth in the places we need it. So we can offload at our most busy sites onto the Clearwire network as we need it. So that plan is what we have in place. Um, we are in the stage of we're wrapping up all of our final field integration tests. It's gone tremendously well. We're in a position to really say the technology absolutely works. It's delivering the benefits and the performance improvements that we expected. We've had, um, we're in the, right at that, that knee in the curve of starting to ramp up and really bring up uh, lots of cell sites on air. So you'll here we've publicly stated that we will, we're planning to put 12,000 on air by the end of the year. And so we see ourselves on a terrific trajectory to make that happen this year. And we expect most of the program to wrap up uh, at the end of 2013. There'll probably be some carryover, uh, you know, long tail sites or smaller markets that may carry over into 2014, but, that'll, but the majority of the network will be upgraded by the end of 2013. So I want to show you a little bit about the before and after. 
There we go. So as I mentioned, what is a little bit unique, you know, some of the capabilities and the technology we have in the platform have already been deployed, um, carriers in the US, carriers overseas. I think ours is unique in that it brings all of it together and takes full advantage of the capabilities. So one of the things that we did decide to do is we decided to reinvest in 3G. We thought that was very important. We believe CDMA, EBD are gonna be around for quite a while. We've got a huge embedded base of 3G customers. It continues to grow. Um, you know, the iconic devices are still, uh, the iconic device is still a 3G device. So you have that customer base that's gonna be using the 3G network for a long time. You have voice that is gonna still be served by 3G. We believed it was important to deliver 3G improvements as well uh, while we were doing the upgrade. And this is an example in New York City, not the most rural of areas. But uh, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, just to give you the color coding, it doesn't maybe show up quite as well in the distance there, but we have uh, green, yellow, and gray. So green is really our very best in-building penetration coverage. Yellow is very good. And then gray is basically roaming areas. So the, those would be areas where we have no coverage. And in some cases, these are state parks and such, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we have those kinds of pockets uh, in the marketplace and, and outside of our, our normal co coverage area. So on the right-hand side, and this is just a 3G improvement, is what the network propagation will look like. You can see almost a complete elimination of the yellow, the gray shrinks down. This is indicative of the type of link budget improvement that we have seen demonstrated in our field testing and in the initial commercially turned up cell sites that we have today. So we've really confirmed that this is the type of improvement that our customers will experience on every handset that they have. So it, you know, the ones that are getting the newest handsets get all the benefits because they have the 850 chipset in them. And as we turn up the 850 voice carrier, they'll get that benefit. All customers will, though, experience quite a bit of improvement. We've seen it, we demonstrated it. That's why I say the technology really works. On the 4G front, okay, there we go. Stay there, okay. Um, on the left-hand side is the WiMAX coverage. And on the right-hand side will be the LT coverage in the New York City area after the upgrade. Um, so obviously, very, very dramatic difference from left to right. Um, it's obviously an area that is critical for us to stay competitive. Um, the, you know, our, the, the duopolists are out there deploying their LT networks and we're working really hard to catch up with them and create an equally competitive network with broad national coverage. Okay. In addition, there we go, uh, for us, this huge financial benefit. The performance improvement I cited does things like reduce our roaming costs. Now, before many of you get alarmed, <laughs> so, the majority of our roaming expense is actually in footprint. And that's obviously not, was not my objective in designing the network. So we are in footprint. As you see the, the green turn to yellow and the gray shrink in our coverage area, that's where we derive a lot of roaming costs reduction is in the areas that we cover with, with our network. Okay. <laughs> Steve, am I supposed to dance now? Uh. <laughs> all right, all right. Terrific. I love it. All right. So... All right. Oh, jeez. All right. Bring the volume down. There we go. I think we're back. Perfect. Okay. And in conclusion, no. Uh, all right. Um, so one benefit we get is reduction in input for roaming costs. Second one, as I mentioned, we have we serve. 55 million customers today on 68,000 cell sites. In the future, we'll be serving those customers on 38,000 cell sites. That's easy math. Huge benefit by being able to consolidate networks. We see uh, overall reduction in operating costs, notably our 
uh, electrical bill will go down quite a bit. I said it was a much greener platform, consumes less electricity. You also get the advanced techniques of self-optimizing networks for recurring maintenance and such that will help reduce the recurring future costs of maintaining the network. And then what's really crucial for a company that differentiates itself with unlimited plans, you know, one of our tasks is how do you drive the cost per bit, the cost per voice minute down as low as you can go. And this really does it dramatically reduces what I call our cost to grow. So our, our unit cost for gigabyte, unit cost for minutes, all drop by 50% or more as our customer base continues to grow and as usage continues to grow. So as you can tell, huge, huge, huge benefits for us. That's why we place the bet. That's why we're spending the money. That's why we're making this commitment and investment. That's why I'm losing a lot of sleep these days trying to get this program up as fast as we can. Every day lost is a day of benefit lost. So we're working really hard, really fast with our OEM pa partners. They're doing a great job. I think I've estimated we've got something like five or 6,000 people mobilized between employees of mine, employees of the OEM, subcontractors throughout the country that are all working simultaneously on our network because the whole network is in the process of being upgraded as we speak. One more slide. Thank you. All right, so I talked a little bit about 4G. You saw the map, the change in the map. Obviously, it puts us on an LTE roadmap that opens up the whole door uh, for all the types of services that an IB network that happens to be mobile now can provide. So our initial deployment, obviously, is a kind of a release nine deployment. It's called, I don't wanna call it the vanilla because it's the latest, most advanced capabilities that have been delivered to the, to the globe around LTE. So that's our initial deployment. From there, we keep moving. So we move from there to new releases that improve capacity. We have better coordination because what we will need to do is to be able to use small cells in order to continue to extend the use of our own spectrum as all carriers will. And there's a lot of discussion and work being done on, on small cell technology to help further extend the spectrum that we have and increase the capacity so that in a future release of LTE adds the type of coordination, capacity coordination and such so that continues to grow the network. And then most interestingly then, of course, it positions you to begin thinking about Volte deployment. So, you know, years, I've been 20 plus years and with Sprint alone and 30 in the business and watched the evolution from TDM wireline to VoIP wireline. Took a while to get going. Well, we're kind of forklifting all those VoIP technologies, putting them in the mobile space. <clears throat> so you can expect that to come a lot faster. Now, I've been asked a lot about what do I predict? I'm a terrible predictor. I can predict that it's coming, but it takes a lot of time before you can get universal adoption. And of course, I did mention we're going to LTE 800 out in, in, uh, in 2014. But the concept of Volte, so we've got uh, other carriers that are pushing really hard and have clearly made a bet that they expect Volte to really be universally adopted. And that's where I think there's this whole world of LTE opens up opportunities and opportunities for us if you hit the slide, please. Um, opportunities for us as a, as a new member with all of you in, in the room here. What I've got here is the national, our national map. The green is us and the blue is pretty much everybody else in the room. Um, the world of LTE, the world of Volte, to get universal adoption, <clears throat> you have to have a network that's equivalent to a voice network, which means you've got to cover the two and a half plus million square miles of the country because that's what a voice network combines today. So uh, we're excited to be part of RCA in part to continue the working relationship that we've been developing over the years to find ways to how do you serve the blue areas effectively, economically, and collaboratively between us and the membership in the room. So we look forward to talking more about that, finding ways that we can make a national map that's extremely competitive to LT, to, to, the, to AT&T and Verizon, um, and really look forward to our future participation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve <laughs> to introduce our next speaker. <clears throat> and, to, and to do that, we're gonna have a closing dance. No.
But thank you again for your time. Hopefully you got something out of that. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have the music. Uh, you, you can buy the CD on the outside uh, after it's over. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, let me uh, thank Bob, uh, especially for his talk and also his willingness uh, and desire to work with RCE members to help build an ecosystem that uh, allow our members to, uh, to have a nationwide capability. And uh, we're looking forward to working with him. Now let me uh, introduce another uh, very interesting uh, and uh, dynamic uh, person, Doug Hutchison. Uh, Doug is the President, Chief Executive Officer, and also serves on the board of directors of Leap Wireless International, the parent company of Cricket Communications. And we are indeed privileged to hear from uh, Doug today. Since joining Leap Wireless as a member of its founding management team in uh, September 1998, uh, Doug has held a number of executive positions, including serving as the chief financial officer, pretty important position, as well as uh, other vice president roles in strategic planning, product, uh, business development, and was also, I think, vice president of uh, marketing for wireless infrastructure at Qualcomm. So uh, he has a plethora of experience, and uh, uh, now he's Cricket's president and CEO, and Doug is responsible for developing all the implementing high-level strategies and overseeing all the corporate affairs. So I'm extremely pleased that Doug has uh, joined us today, and even more pleased that Cricket is, uh, has joined RCA's effort uh, and fight to, to support competitive carriers as one of our newest members. So uh, here to speak to us about Cricket and back to the future for our carriers, uh, please welcome Doug Hutchison. Thank you, Steve. I hope all the uh, electronics work. Well, we can hope. Good morning. Uh, well done, Bob. Thank you for your presentation in advance. Let me say good morning to everyone here. Uh, I'd like to introduce Cricket Communications as uh, at least uh, either one of or the newest member of RCA. Take a look at some of the challenges facing the, the wireless industry and, su and suggest some avenues to enhance competitive strength of carriers uh, of all of us here in the room. We're dedicated to a vibrant and competitive industry we're excited about the association with RCA and look forward to working with you on issues that affect the success of our industry. Next slide, please. One more forward. We founded Cricket in 1999 with a simple but audacious idea. Everyone should have access to the best value innovations in unlimited wireless service. Today, Cricket is the sixth largest facilities-based carrier in the U.S., serving nearly six million customers and one of the fastest growing carriers in the wireless industry. The possibilities are unlimited. So who is Cricket? A carrier that offers unlimited flat rate plans and no <coughs> longer term contracts. Our pricing is straightforward. The service we provide is exceptionally reliable and our customers' bills are predictable. We cover 95 million POPs with our own 3G network, and in 2011, we expanded our reach across the nation when we launched the industry's first hybrid facilities-based MVNO model. We traditionally focused on customers that have been underserved by other wireless providers. Historically, we served a core customer base that is largely ethnic, traditionally younger, and most often has lower household incomes, uh, frequently less than $50,000 per year. We note that there generally is some correlation over time between age and household income, so we think we uh, do well in that area to help people advance their lives. However, the wireless landscape is evolving, and we've broadened our message to reach real-life value seekers, people who aspire to have the best wireless experience at the best value, no matter where they live and what they earn. Our customers' usage is different from the norm. 90% use Cricket as their primary phone, and about 75% use it as their only phone. And they'll talk an average of 1,500 minutes a month. Cricket's pain advanced service is attractive to consumers. It does not require long-term contracts 
We generally do not offer large subsidies on the handsets uh, we sell. As a result, we provide customers with a monthly service at a rate that truly reflects the cost of that service. By separating handset costs from the cost of service, we allow customers to make better, more informed decisions about products and services they purchase and the carriers they purchase from. Cons customers find this approach appealing and are choosing to purchase pay in advance services. Cricket focuses on high value, unlimited services. We pioneered unlimited wireless calling in 1999 introduced unlimited text messaging when many carriers were charging 10 cents per text and were a leader when we introduced unlimited prepaid broadband. We recently began offering our newest innovative product, Move Music, which offers customers unlimited music downloads as a part of their monthly service plan. The Move, Move is the first music service designed exclusively for mobile phones and Move recently reached over a half a million customers, making it the second largest digital subscription music service in the US in less than one year. Perhaps even more impressive than the growth in wireless use is the changing nature of the growth. When we launched Cricket in 1999, I can assure you that there were no smartphones. In contrast, smartphones account for approximately 60% of handset sales in the fourth quarter of 2011. So where are we today as an industry? As a direct result of the innovators in this room, the wireless industry in the United States provides consumers with price plans and service offerings that fit almost every budget and almost every need today. As a result of competition in the wireless industry, encouraged through spectrum policies adopted over the last 16 years, US consumers have a wide variety of choice among wireless service providers today. But the wireless industry of tomorrow will certainly look different than the wireless industry today, in large part because of continuing technological advances, the increasing sophistication of devices and applications available to consumers and the ways consumers are weaving the use of those devices and applications into their everyday lives. The innovations that began with the advent of mobile data and the accelerated introduction of smartphones are driving the future of the wireless industry. And the future is here today. Sophisticated devices and applications and their increasing use present our industry with significant challenges. They're highlighted on this slide. The first challenge we face is the growing demand for wireless capacity. Demand for data services is expected to grow approximately 10 times over the next four to five years. We expect customers will consume six terabytes of data per month by 2015. That's six trillion bits of data per month or more than 70 trillion bits of data per year. It's equivalent of consumers downloading one and a half billion DVDs per month. Rapidly increasing consumption is a trend <clears throat> all of the operators in this room are contemplating as they plan for the future. Growing demand leads naturally to the second challenge we face, spectrum scarcity. You know it, you live with it every day. So does the FCC, the NTIA, and Congress. In the end, projected demand for wireless data can only be met by making more spectrum available. Yet dis despite intense intention, there is no near-term solution to the spectrum crunch. As all of you know, Congress reclaimed the 700 megahertz D-block for public safety. And the only new spectrum that could be available in the near to midterm is for the FCC to auction 40 megahertz of auction two, AWS two and three spectrum. An auction of that spectrum could happen, theoretically. But with respect to AWS three, the FCC and NTAA want to pair the block with new spectrum to be identified and released from the federal government. And that process has proven again 
complicated. In fact, on Tuesday of this week, the NTIA released a report indicating that it may not be practic practical to pair AWS 3 spectrum with the 1755 to 8 1850 megahertz block as generally proposed by the industry. So the status of the new AW auction remains up in the air. Bringing TV broadcast spectrum to, <coughs> to the market is an even longer term prospect. Re <coughs> recently enacted spectrum uh, legislation gives the FCC authority to conduct incentive auctions to compensate TV broadcasters for spectrum they may relinquish, and that is a step forward. But there are many implement implementation challenges the FCC must confront before the process is set and the broadcast spectrum comes to market. FCC Commissioner McDowell recently stated that he didn't expect the spectrum to come to the market for at least four years and suggested that it will take as much as 10 years to deploy this spectrum. And while the FCC originally targeted 120 megahertz of new spectrum from broadcast TV auctions, it now appears the spectrum will become available <coughs> that will become available may be substantially less. The development of the wholesale model utilizing MSS spectrum is also uncertain. LightSquare's plans to become a wholesale supplier to the industry is stalled, and the development of the path for the S-band spectrum is not yet clear to the industry. Finally, BRS spectrum remains underutilized, although Clearwire plans to continue building out in the coming years. The lack of new spectrum over the near term makes spectrum acquisition in the aftermarket an important option for many carriers. Appropriate purchases and sales and trades in the aftermarket can allow carriers to add spectrum to their portfolio in areas with heavy demand, financed at times with the sale or swap of spectrum they're not fully utilizing. Even with such transactions, however, the lack of new near-term spectrum puts pressure on us as an industry participants to find creative solutions to expand the capacity of our wireless networks. It won't surprise anyone if I tell you that wireless ca carriers operate in capital-intensive industry, and the near- and mid-term demands on carriers are daunting, leading to challenge number three, <coughs> the need for affordable capital. As an initial matter, we all must maintain our existing networks. That's table stakes. Next is enhancing coverage and capacity by building new cell sites outside our existing networks and splitting cell sites inside our uh, existing networks. On average, a new cell site may cost $250,000, so ex <coughs> expansion and uh, densification are expensive. In addition, we must all keep up with technology. In the near term, that means upgrading to LTE. We estimate that it may cost Cricket approximately $10 per covered pop to overlay LTA, LTE onto our existing CDMA networks. Each carrier's costs, of course, will depend on geography and population density of their markets, the spectrum they're utilizing, and the scale of the build. Finally, given the cost of acquiring spectrum, we're all considering whether and how we purchase additional spectrum when it eventually becomes available. Spectrum scarcity naturally yields to additional challenges, driving an increasing need for wireless networks to talk <coughs> and rely upon one another. Our customers and your customers expect to be able to use their handsets seamlessly as they travel throughout the United States. Thus, Roaming in general, and data roaming in particular, is another challenge we face. Cricket is proud of the leadership role we have taken on voice and data roaming issues over the past several years. And although the rules <coughs> that the FCC has promulgated did not match our proposals or the proposals you all advance, the rules do represent progress. However, Verizon has appealed the FCC's data roaming rules, and Cricket, together with RCA and others, are supporting the FCC rules in court. We all look forward to a court decision upholding the, those rules. Our perception is that the status of voice roaming has improved, in large part because of the agreements the carriers in this room have entered into with each other. But the fight is not over, and we must all continue to focus on obtaining voice roaming agreements 
with reasonable prices and terms from all technology compatible carriers. Most importantly, data roaming agreements continue to lag. And as we move to 4G world, customer expectations can only be met through 4G roaming agreements. The roaming challenge clearly remains. The fifth element I note today is the challenge of interoperability. This is an intense focus of RCA, so I will not dwell on it. Suffice it to say that the creation of two different band classes for the lower 700 megahertz spectrum puts A block holders at risk. At risk for unfavorable handset costs and selection because of reduced scale. At risk of unfavorable handset time to market and at risk of unfavorable roaming opportunities. Although we do not yet own 700 megahertz spectrum, we look forward to acquiring spectrum in Chicago in the near future. We recognize RCA's concerns over interoperability issues and expect to participate with other members of RCA in responding to the FCC's recent interoperability proceedings, as well as separate proceedings the FCC intends to initiate with respect to Channel 51 interference. I'd like to discuss three opportunities to address these challenges, deferring for the purposes of this address the challenge of interoperability. As I've noted, RCA <coughs> excuse me, and its members have already deeply engaged in that issue. With respect to Spectrum, it's not cliche to say Spectrum is the lifeblood of the industry. With steeply growing demand, new cost-effective Spectrum will be a must. The FCC and NTAIA need to remain focused on bringing AWS 2 and 3 Spectrum to the market and they must carefully identify and access uh, <coughs> existing government uses of spectrum. Spectrum not required for efficient service of government purposes needs to be av made available to the commercial wireless industry. In the same manner, the FCC must continue its efforts to move forward rapidly on TV broadcast incentive auctions. With respect to MSS spectrum, the FCC, FCC should facilitate efforts to find a path for the L-band spectrum to co coexist with adjacent uses and become available for mobile service. As an additional path to address exploding demand, <coughs> spectrum scarcity and capital investment costs, we competitive carriers should explore spectrum and network sharing options, a path for carriers to cooperate and seek maximum operating efficiencies while they continue to compete actively for customers. Network sharing strategies may permit competitive carriers to enhance spectrum efficiency, improve scale, and reduce expenses, all allowing them to reduce the cost of service to, co to con consumers, improve their competitiveness, and increase their bottom line results. Most carriers in this room will be deploying LTE on three bands, AWS, PCS, and the lower 700 megahertz. And the LTE technology will transcend GSM and CDMA divide that has separated carriers in the past. So network sharing becomes more practical as we roll out LTE. The flexibility of LTE network architecture also allows different flavors of network sharing. At a minimum, LTE architecture will allow carriers to share the radio network. Carriers can maintain their own core equipment or pair shared radio with common core equipment. In the same manner, shared network assets can utilize spectrum that is pooled among carriers, or each carrier could use shared network assets to operate dedicated spectrum. New software-defined BTS radios could also be used to operate legacy GSM and CDMA systems from the same shared cell sites that operate new LTE networks. Pooling spectrum may improve the utilization of scarce spectrum resources. Quite simply, a big shared pipe is more efficient than multiple smaller pipes. In addition, busy hours and capacity hotspots are likely to vary between carriers with different business models and customer bases, again permitting greater utilization of the fixed amount of spectrum. Finally, multiple carriers can support a greater number of cell sites than any single carrier, increasing the utilization of our scarcest 
resources spectrum and at the same time reducing the total of number of cell sites deployed on an aggregated basis. Shared network assets can also deliver lower capital costs with new radios supporting larger spectrum bandwidth and multiple standards. Capital efficiencies can also be achieved through shared antennas network and network cores. And of course, shared network assets are likely to produce lower operating costs. The proposal to share networks is not as radical as it may sound. Operators in Europe already share network assets, and in the U.S., carriers have begun to approach network sharing with reciprocal roaming agreements that provide transparent service to customers when they travel outside their home networks. Sprint's Spectrum Hosting Program with LightScare Squared was a proposal to share network costs between companies, and Verizon's LTE and Rural America Program offers rural carriers access to Spectrum and LTE coupled with a reciprocal roaming agreement in areas where Verizon does not plan to build its own network. Negotiating network sharing agreements will not be easy, but these arrangements offer a path to address three of the major challenges I outlined earlier in my presentation, the demand for data, spectrum scarcity, and capital required to operate and enhance our network. While we wait for new spectrum, and regardless of whether we proceed with network sharing arrangement, reasonable wholesale data roaming is required to full ensure full utilization of provider spectrum and to ensure a vibrant and competitive industry with multiple carriers providing choice to consumers and pricing pressure on competitors. Customers demand national service, and for RCA carriers to continue to attract customers utilize their spectrum and maintain competitive compressors, they exert they must be able to provide nationwide roaming services to their customers. Carriers in this room, together with RCA, must continue to press for re <coughs> reasonable roaming rates and arrangements. We must continually educate regulators and legislatures of the competitive function we serve and the importance of national voice and data roaming to our customers. We must ensure that policymakers understand the state of roaming in the industry and applicable cases we must press for vigorous enforcement of FCC rules. And we must encourage the FCC to use its authority to ensure that roaming, a practice <clears throat> which, is, which it found can strengthen competition and benefit the public, is available to customers based on reasonable wholesale da data arrangements. We have come a long ways in the past last 10 years. In many important and exciting ways, we're just beginning. If, the change is only, uh, if change is the only constant, then continued change and the evolution of our business is something we can count on. We at Cricket are very pleased with, to be the newest members of RCA and look forward to working with all of you to meet the challenges ahead. Thank you.